In this module we're going to be looking at carbon dioxide and the pH. Now we look at measuring different levels of pH. We do this and we can actually observe it in an experiment. And as part of your course, you do need to perform this experiment to understand pH and how it works. So we have, when we review the pH scale, and again, if you want to look at this more in depth, you can have a look at the pH videos. We have a pH from 0 to 14. At 0, it's very, very acidic. At 7, its pH is neutral, which means it's very safe for the body. And pH 14, it's very basic. Another word for basic is alkaline. Reviewing the pH scale. Now at pH zero, we know that it's very bad for us. In fact, if it went on our skin, it would burn us. So examples of this are battery acid. Now between each level from zero to one, there's actually 10 levels between that. pH is found on a logarithmic scale. So between pH, pH zero and pH one, there's 10 levels. And we go from battery acid to hydrochloric acid. We actually have hydrochloric acid in our stomachs between pH 1.5 and 3.5. And it can actually fluctuate depending on what we eat, what we consume, if we're drinking, if we're not, if we haven't eaten for a while. Um, and the hydrochloric acid is obviously safe in our stomachs. But if we were to get a strong hydrochloric acid and put it on our skin, it would burn through our skin. Now at pH 2, and remember there's 10 levels between each, at pH 2 we've got lemon juice and vinegar. Now lemon juice and vinegar are safe for consumption and that's 10 levels up from hydrochloric acid. However, we would not consume that in large amounts. Up from that, pH 3, we've got grapefruit and soft drink. At pH 4, we've got tomato juice and acid rain. At pH 5, we have black coffee. At pH 6, we've got urine, and at pH 7, it's water. Now distilled water has nothing added to it, whereas tap water might have some ions in it that's present. Also, it has been treated with chlorine. Now, pH, 7, pH 8, we have seawater. pH 9, baking soda. pH 10, Great Salt Lake. pH 11, we have ammonia solution. Ammonia solution is toxic for the body. However, when you, it's more so when you smell it. If you were to get ammonia solution, it's actually a household cleaning product. And when you use this cleaning product, if you put it too close to your nose, you will notice that it will burn your nose hairs and burn your throat. So it is very important when you waft, when you smell things, you need to waft them. And I know it sounds funny, but in the science lab, that's how you're meant to do it. If you smell a chemical, you're meant to waft it towards you instead of smelling it directly because it can actually do some harm. At pH 12, you've got soapy water. At pH 13, we have bleach. And at pH 14, we've got liquid drain cleaner. Again, pH 13 and pH 14 are very dangerous for your skin. If you put that on your skin, it's different to an acid. If you put this on your skin, it actually turns your skin to a soap and you don't realize it at first. So that is why it is extremely important if you feel you have got any chemicals on your skin, to wash it off with water. Now, this is the experiment. The effect of dissolved carbon dioxide on the pH of water. As a requirement of this course, you must perform a first-hand investigation to demonstrate the effect of dissolved carbon dioxide on the pH of water. A first-hand investigation means any experiment that you perform yourself. So it may not necessarily be this one, but you may need to perform an experiment to show that you understand pH. Now, what is in our breath? In humans, exhalation is the movement of air out of the bronchial tubes through the airways to the external environment. The waste products in our breath, so the main reason for exhalation is to get rid of carbon dioxide, which is the waste product of gas exchange in humans. Air is brought in through the body through inhalation. And during this process, air is taken through the lungs for oxygen to be absorbed into the alveoli. So for our air to be taken in, it's in the gas in air, taken into our esophagus, down into our bronchi, into our bronchioles, which are little tubes, and it ends up in these air sacs. These air sacs are called alveoli. And the alveolus here that we have 
um, up on this screen, carbon, so oxygen comes in, and oxygen we want into the blood. Around that we can see this tube, and that is a capillary. Now capillaries are important to absorb this gas, and what is amazing about this is it goes from a gas into a liquid. So as it's being absorbed into your lungs, it's going from a gas into being a liquid. How does it do this? Well firstly, the lungs are moist, and secondly, the lungs are warm. When you add warm to a reaction, it actually helps the reaction to take place. So, in science, what is diffusion? Diffusion refers to the movement of molecules from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration by random molecular motion. Now, an example of this, there's two great examples, and one is using tea, and another one is perfume. So I'll go to the perfume experiment first. If you were to spray a perfume, and obviously it's very concentrated where you first spray this perfume, but if you were to wait a couple of minutes, over on the other side of the room, this perfume would actually disperse. And in a couple of minutes time, no matter where you're standing in that room, you would smell that perfume. The other one that I've got here where you can actually see diffusion is if you get a hot glass of water. And if you were to put a tea bag in this water, you can see diffusion happen. It's going from a high concentration of molecules within the tea bag, and then it's dispersing out. If you were to leave that hot water for a few minutes, you would actually see that that whole water would be colored, that the color of the tea. Diffusion in the alveoli allows for the exchange of oxygen into the capillaries and the removal of carbon dioxide from the capillaries to be removed by exhalation. So diffusion actually helps this process happen. The effect of dissolved carbon dioxide on the pH of water. Now, if we were to get two beakers of water and blow through one straw into one beaker, what do you think the result will be with the pH? Do you think the pH will decrease and become more acidic? Or do you think it will increase and become more alkaline? Press pause here to have a think. Okay, let's continue. So, the hypothesis for this experiment, and you need to make up the hypothesis, it's just a statement. Remember, it's not a question, so don't say, I think this will happen. You don't put I in it, you just say what you think is going to happen in a statement, no I involved. So exhaled breath will decrease the pH of water, and this is what we're expecting from this experiment. So why does carbon dioxide decrease the pH of water? Well, with water and carbon dioxide, the actual molecule that comes out is carbonic acid. So carbonic acid, as you can see here, it's got more hydrogen ions in it. And because it's got more hydrogen ions, it means it's becoming more acidic. So this is because a human breath contains carbon dioxide, with, which reacts with water in small amounts to car form carbonic acid. And that's the formula for carbonic acid, H2CO3. You can see that reaction taking place here. So carbon dioxide plus water equals carbonic acid. So the materials here, we need water, we need two beakers, straws, universal indicator, and permanent markers. We need permanent markers to actually label these beakers. We label it beaker A and beaker B. We need universal indicator, and the universal indicator colors the water. Universal indicator is different in each science lab. So some might color the water a different color compared to this one up here. So keep that in mind. So we've got two beakers out. So the method, and you need to write this up in steps, it's not dot points, it's not set sentence form, method should always be written up in steps. In pairs, take two medium sized beakers and label them A and B. Half fill each with water. Put in 10 to 20 drops of universal indicator to color the water nicely. So if, if your universal indicator is strong, you may only need five drops. Using a straw, gently blow into the water in beaker A for 10 seconds. Observe the color of the water, any possible change, and repeat step four at least three more times. So you're actually blowing in at 10 second intervals. And then you stop, you look at the water, record, then another 10 second interval. At the end of your experiment, measure the pH in both A and B. Record in a table and graph results. It is always important to graph your results and in, and put your results in a table. Um, if you always can, always graph as well. It will always give you more marks, especially if you're doing reports in science. 
Okay, so this table illustrates the pH of water after breathing through a straw into water with a pH indicator. So this is what your table is going to look like. We've got big A, we've got bigger B. We've got the initial recording of pH. So what color is it initially? We've got the pH of water after 10 seconds, pH of water after 20, pH of water after 30, and pH of water after 40 seconds of breath. So bigger A and bigger B. Remember, bigger A we're actually breathing into, and bigger B we're leaving alone. Why do we have a bigger B if we're leaving it alone? Because that is our control. We need a control for this experiment to show that when we're breathing in bigger A and it's changing, bigger B doesn't change. So what we're actually showing by having two beakers is that it's the pH of the carbon dioxide from our breath that's actually changing the water and not any air reactions that's happening. We can represent this in a graph. And as you can see in this graph, we have beaker A and beaker B. In beaker A, you can see it's declining. The pH declines from 7 to 6. And you can see the different steps. In beaker B, you can see that it stays the same. It stays at pH 7. Now, in this graph, it's not the best representation. If you did a perfect graph of this, the, on the left-hand side, you can see the pH, and it should go all the way down to 0. However, it's fine for this one here. We're actually representing and showing the, the difference in the changes between beaker A and beaker B. The experiment setup. So we can see here we've got two beakers. We've got the universal indicator pH color chart. Now remember, this is going to be different for each pH universal indicator. At seven, we have a green color. Um, and we're expecting it to go more in the acid environment instead of the basic environment. So if it's going from seven, we're expecting a color change. And we can actually see that after we breathe in the straw for 40 seconds, it has changed to a different pH. This is a pH of six. So this table illustrates the pH of water after breathing through a straw into water with pH indicator. Now our initial reading is seven for both. After 10 seconds, we can see that there's some change in beaker A, which is 6.8, compared to seven of beaker B. After 20 seconds of breath, we have 6.5. After 30 seconds, 6.2, and after 40 seconds, we have 6. Now, you always have to look at, when we graph these results, what actually happens. This graph is a pretty good graph to actually show the differences between them. If it was an even better graph, it would actually have the pH value all the way down to zero, and that's a scientific graph. However, for, this, for the purpose of this experiment, I'm showing the difference of pH and how it's changing. So beaker A, remember you always need Beaker A, actually, these are swapped, and you can actually see that the beaker B should be beaker A. So because beaker A is the one that declined, and beaker B stayed the same. So we always talk about a discussion after doing these experiments. Both beakers A and B had initial measurement at pH of 7, but beaker A became more acidic over time and finished at pH of 6. Now this is something that you would have to put in your discussion. Beaker B stayed neutral at a pH of 7. And you can explain these as well because it is the control, so it is very important to have beaker B as well. This is because there was no carbon dioxide to make it more acidic. So how can your experiment be improved if you were to repeat it? Or can you extend this experiment? Personally, this experiment in particular could be improved, and that's if Obviously, there was a decline, but we didn't wait for it to see if it would decline even more. So we only did this experiment for 40 seconds. Now, the, for the exhaled breath experiment, it may be improved by extending the time to make sure the pH was reached its lowest point. So we could extend it to be two minutes of breath, okay, instead of just 40 seconds. So mammals try to maintain a blood pH of 7.4. Why do you think that we need to maintain this blood pH of 7.4. And the reason why is because your carbon dioxide in your blood makes your blood more acidic. So if you were to breathe, uh, or if you weren't to breathe and get rid of car excess carbon dioxide, it would make your blood more acidic, which is very, very toxic to our body. So that's why we need to breathe and get rid of carbon dioxide. Now, Risk assessments. For every assessment task, you need to look at risk assessments. Now, can you think of any risk assessments for this experiment? There actually are quite a few, but for this one here, we'll just look at two. The first one here is when you actually use a straw, we're so used to sucking up a straw. We never breathe through a straw. 
Um, so when you suck up a straw, it's just an an instinct. So we need to get a beaker and you need to be very mindful when doing this experiment. You need to only breathe through the straw because the problem with sucking is that you can ingest universal indicator. The risk is you're drinking a chemical and it can have toxic effects of your body. Different universal indicators have actually different levels of toxicity. And the precaution, make sure the students understands the risk and to only blow through the straw and to not suck up the straw. So it's very important that the student who's performing that experiment understands the risks beforehand. The other one is we're using chemicals. Any chemicals, it, there's risks, whether it's something that's more gentle or something that's more harsh. So there's always the risk of getting chemicals on the skin or especially for this one in the eye because if you're blowing through the straw, there's bubbles and the bubbles can splash up into your eye. For the reasons of this, you need to wear safety goggles and also gloves just for your protection. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you for watching.